Well, welcome everyone. We'll just give it a few more moments to let more people get on today's webinar. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Designing Strategy for Serious Injury and Fatality Prevention. My name is Magali Flores. I'm a project manager with the Campbell Institute at the National Safety Council. And um, I normally lead our outreach efforts, but for today's call, I'm acting as moderator. Um, today, you'll be hearing from our presenter, Taylor Abel. But before we begin uh, the main portion of our program, I want to give a little bit of background about who we are. So NSC is a nonprofit organization with the mission to save lives from the workplace to any place. NSC is divided into different practice areas, one of them focusing on workplace. Under that workplace practice area lives the Campbell Institute. Now the Campbell Institute at the National Safety Council is the center of EHS excellence with the mission of helping organizations achieve and sustain EHS excellence. And the way we're able to do that is through participation from high performing organizations uh, by hosting events with leading edge topics and, facil and facil facilitating knowledge sharing, such as what we are doing today. On the next slide, you'll see a list of our participants. Um, so our participants are made up of our members and our partners. Um, so if we can pull up the next slide, um, our members you'll see in the lighter gray honeycombs and our partners you'll see in the darker gray. We have about 40 members and the way, um, in order to become a member, you must apply, be vetted, and display alignment with the Institute's missions, the, the Institute's mission. And as you can see, all of these companies have made that commitment. One of the organizations you will hear from today is United Rentals. Um, but before I turn it over to Taylor, a few housekeeping notes. You will, able, you will be able to ask questions via the Q&A button that you see on the bottom of your screen. We'll leave time at the end for a few questions. There will also be a few polls throughout the presentation. We encourage you to interact with our speaker today by answering the questions as they come up. Lastly, a recording will be distributed uh, to anyone who registered for today's webinar, um, and it'll include the slides that you see today. I wanna to thank Taylor for his time today. He was a big part of developing our latest work on SIF prevention. Uh, but before we begin, a little bit on Taylor. Taylor Abel is currently the Director of Safety at United Rentals, where he leads safety for the Power HVAC team, along with safety improvement projects for the company. Prior to United Rentals, Mr. Abel worked for the Mosaic Company for 25 years in various roles from the site level to corporate governance, including Assistant Vice President for EHS Performance Improvement for the Corporation, Assistant Vice President Health, Safety and Security of the Phosphate Business Unit, EHS Director of Mosaic's Global Supply Chain, and Senior Manager of Health and Safety at the world's largest underground potash mine in Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan. While on expat assignment in Canada, Mr. Abel was the founding chair for the Saskatchewan Mining Association's Serious Accident and Fatality Elimination Working Group. Mr. Abel is now the chair of the Serious Injury and Fatali Fatality Prevention Work Group for the Campbell Institute. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from the University of Florida, a Master's of Science degree in Engineering Management from the University of South Florida, and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Florida. And with that, I'll hand it over to Taylor. Thank you, Magali, for that kind introduction. Really appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone's time today. First, I'd just like to say thanks to my company, United Rentals, for their support and membership in the Campbell Institute. United Rentals is the largest equipment rental company in the world. And we have over 19,000 employees and over 1,100 branches across North America, and even have expanded with a few branches in Europe. Um, our mission is to deploy the best people, the best equipment, and solutions to enable our customers to safely build a better and stronger future, driven by values. And of course, safety first is near and dear to my heart, along with passion for people. So appreciate United Rentals uh, support. Serious intentionality prevention. With that, our time together today, I'm gonna start off and talk about um, the serious injury and fatality paradigm. Just make sure everyone starts off with that foundation. And then I'm going to go into SIF implementation 
prevention strategies, uh, as well as lessons from implementation with member companies. And then lastly, we'll touch on SIF prevention during COVID-19. It was about 12 years ago that I got involved in SIF work. Um, and I got involved in it out of necessity. Uh, tragically, we had experienced a contractor fatality and the gentleman was uh, drowning his bulldozer when it sloughed off and, and went into the water and he couldn't get out. And I, I remember being at the funeral and his granddaughter asked her mother and said, why isn't Pappy coming home? And of course, it was gut wrenching, it, it, was, it was horrible. And it left an indelible impression that has guided me since that time to do everything in my power to never ever let that happen again. And so this is important work this is noble work to ensure that our teams go home safely every single day. And I wanna thank you for being here and preventing something like that ha happening at your organization. Now, at that time, a number of years ago, there, there were numerous companies that were experiencing improving recordable injury rate, and yet they were still having life altering injuries or even fatalities. That was my company's experience. But you would think there would be a relationship if you're seeing injuries decrease that you would see some relationship where fatal accidents would also decrease, that they both would move in parallel. Now, if we fast forward to today, we see that sadly, nothing's changed. As a country, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is showing us that the recordable injury rate is decreasing, which is good news, certainly, down to nationally almost a 2.7 in 2018. And yet, our fatality rate has been flat or, or even a slight increase. Back then, the paradox of the improving injury rate with the flat fatality rate, it, it didn't make sense. And Dr. Tom Krause, who's a longstanding thought leader in safety, he established a working group. He established a working group with a number of companies to research this phenomenon. And I was fortunate to work with Dr. Krause. I was also fortunate to work with Kristen Bell of Krause Bell and Don Martin of DACRA, along with a number of other Fortune 500 companies. And what that group discovered was that Heinrich's safety triangle it didn't account for exposure. It didn't account for potential severity. The group's analysis showed that there's a subset of recordable injuries that have the potential to be life altering or fatal. This subset of injuries, one in five, 19% of injuries have SIF exposure, have the potential to be life altering or fatal. It's shocking. So let's say that an employee strains their shoulder, right? Um, and that's about as bad as it gets. I mean, maybe they need physiotherapy. Worst case, maybe they need surgery. Okay? But they're gonna recover and, and they're gonna be fine. Right? And what we don't know is using Iron Rick's triangle is that the employee was grabbing onto a railing to prevent himself from falling 15 feet to the ground below and would have certainly died had he. So by looking deeper into the incident, we learn more. By assessing the potential severity, we can learn and we can ultimately prevent serious injuries and fatalities. Now, Dr. Krauss notes that this subset, the subset of incidents with SIF potential, they're fundamentally different. They're of a different severity and they have different root causes. And it's because of those differences that we require a different strategy to prevent them. We can't keep treating all minor incidents and near misses as if they have the same potential to result in a serious injury or fatality. One size does not fit all when it comes to SIF prevention. So now that we know about the SIF paradigm, let's delve into defining a SIF event and a SIF potential event, because 
SIF prevention, it hinges upon the ability to identify those situations, those work activities, those events that have the a high potential to result in a serious injury or fatality. And of course, fatality is well-defined and well understood. Serious injury, uh, less so. Each organization has its own nuance, but there's not a large difference. A serious injury typically includes one that is life-threatening, right? That requires emergency services to prevent that loss of life. So this wouldn't necessarily be calling the ambulance if someone has a broken arm, but it would be calling the ambulance if someone were crushed by uh, equipment in order to save their life. They've got internal bleeding. So life-threatening is, is considered serious um, by virtually all, all organizations. Life-altering injuries are also considered serious. Life-altering injuries typically defined as something that affects the quality of life of someone and they, they can't play baseball with their daughter or go fishing with their buddies, right? Because of a, a work-related injury that's impacted them for their life. It could also be an injury that requires lifelong medical care. Now that could be a little subjective, kind of know it when you see it, but some organizations have, have taken that a step further and have a list of specific injuries that they consider to be serious, such as amputation, um, loss of an eye. And, and so they use this list of injuries. And that is a, a serious injury. Now it's pretty straightforward when someone has an actual injury, right? but what about when they experience a potential for injury? Or if they have a minor injury, which has a potential for serious or fatal. Now the good news is that most organizations don't have enough actual injuries or fatalities to provide a meaningful data set. That's good news, right? So if we capture those events with potential for a serious injury fatality, that provides more information, that provides more data in order to prevent a serious injury or fatality in the future. To determine potential, most organizations look at an event that could have been worse if not for one factor, if not for one thing that changed. You say, we got lucky. That's one thing that would have changed, right? It could be a control that failed or simply someone standing in a different spot or different timing or something. Now, when determining the potential outcome of how bad the event could have been, a risk matrix is a common tool. It's a good tool to help, right? It, looking at um, the potential severity, right? The consequence, right? Is it a, a, a recordable injury or is it life altering or fatal, right? So you use that scale. And then you can also look at the likelihood of if it happened again, would that outcome be uh, likely or certain or unlikely, right? And using this matrix, you can, we could set our, our, our threshold that anything above a six or nine would be considered to potential. Um, a lot of use around the risk matrix. Now, some organizations, when they're looking at SIP potential, simply use the consequence or the potential severity of consequence, which takes out the, uh, any subjectivity with trying to determine likelihood. And that's especially helpful if the organization doesn't have experience with certain work or the individuals making the assessment don't have that experience or knowledge of what have happened and, and how likely something is to happen again. So one example, a, a company was doing rapid expansion, uh, capital expansion, and there was a lot of crane work, right? And they hadn't done this type of crane work before. Um, and there was a, an incident and it certainly had high consequence. Um, it, it could have been fatal, um, but had they included likelihood, they just they probably would have rated it low. It may not have been included in their SIF analytics, um, but because they only looked at consequence, they were able to include that, and it it simplifies it. Um, so when we look at the the risk matrix. Um, 
you could use that or you could just simply use the potential severity of consequence to determine potential. So we have a, a group question for the group. And does your question, does your organization have a SIF prevention strategy? Yes, fully implemented. Yes, working on implementation or improvement. No, you may have planned, but we have plans to, or no, we, we don't have plans to. We're trying to get some information. So if you could click your screen and provide a response, that would be awesome. Do we have the results, Magali? All right, it's about a split half and half. Um, it's pretty good, pretty good distribution, definitely. So we've got about a third. Um, so that's, that's good to know. So with that information, we've got the SIP paradigm down and let's talk about building a SIF prevention strategy. There are three priorities that have put together. The first one is building engagement. And it's really about building engagement at all levels in the organization. But it's important to start with leadership. Leadership sets the priorities, they control the resources. And although most leaders don't need convincing to implement a SIF prevention strategy, uh, they, because they understand that the organization still has exposure to potentially life-altering risk. And that's motivation enough. And in fact, it's commonly the senior leaders are the ones that are really pushing in the adoption of SIP prevention. And regardless of where it comes within your organization, where that driving force is, it is critical to the success of SIP prevention and, and really most other uh, business efforts that the leaders are on board and championing the cause. Now, educating the workforce on the SIF paradigm is another critical element. Um, we wanna make sure they understand the metrics, that they understand prevention efforts. The education obviously helps them understand that SIF prevention is a priority, but it also increases awareness and understanding of SIFs and SIF prevention. There's a side benefit with all the focus on SIF. It inherently builds engagement around safety overall. And what I found is that organizations, when they're implementing their SIF prevention strategy, they tend to get some tailwinds behind their, their overall uh, safety efforts and, and tend to see a lift around their safety performance and with, it, with, a, with an improvement of their recordable rate typically. And that you know, isn't necessarily unexpected. The final element of building engagement is to recognize and celebrate wins. Now, a few years ago, United Rentals was experiencing bridge strikes, which were a piece of equipment it was, that we were hauling was too tall to pass underneath a bridge. And obviously the consequences can be disastrous. So a team was put together and developed some actions from verifying the height of a truck using a stick, um, simple tool, doesn't need batteries. It's pretty obvious, right? Uh, to route mapping that includes bridge heights and, and rerouting loads if necessary. And this virtually eliminated the issue. Of course, this one was recognized and it was celebrated. And it's important to recognize wins in your own organization. We all work hard and it's uh, I think critical that we take time to to celebrate and, and appreciate all the effort that we put in when we have success. Now, the second area around building a SIF prevention strategy is understanding SIF risk. Okay. All right, I know, I know, Captain Obvious, right? That's why we're here, frankly. Um, now, the fact is that it really is important to understand your organization's risk profile. I'm sorry, risk profile because they're each a little unique to the type of work that you do. So if we look at the rental industry, for example, driving is a significant risk for us. We drove 
over 300 million miles in 2019. It's a lot of time on the road. It's a lot of vehicle risk. Um, and it's important that that's a obviously priority for us. The mining industry differently has, has uh, ground stability, right? They have to make sure that uh, the mine is stable, um, whether it's surface mine or underground mine uh, to keep people safe. Right? It's a significant and unique risk to the mining industry. Warehousing, on the other hand, has significant forklift traffic where you've got people uh, in forklifts, you know, potentially in the same area and, and there's potential, um, you know, high risk for an accident. Now, of course, some of the risks are the same, right? Elevated work as an example, or lockout tagout that transcend most industries. Um, and so it's important to understand your own organization's risk profile. Because when you are, you're able to help your organization get a better understanding of the types of activities that could lead to a serious injury or fatality at your organization. So detecting SIF precursors in the field is the next uh, area of understanding risk. A precursor is typically defined as a high risk situation where control is either absent or ineffective, right? If it's allowed to continue, it will result in a serious injury or fatality. So it's a two part definition, high risk situation and the control is not there completely. But certainly organizations are good at identifying things like hot work, lockout, tag out, um, other high risk activities, maybe confined space. Now, while these activities are high risk, they don't aren't necessarily uh, precursors, right? There has to be the additional element that the management control is absent or ineffective. So working at heights in and of itself is not a precursor, but working at heights without fall protection is. Repairing equipment by itself is not a precursor, but repairing equipment that is not de-energized is a precursor. We're still a little bit early on in our ability to consistently identify precursors and it's an area that needs more development. But you can imagine that if we know about these situations, we can better correct them and ultimately save someone's life. This area also really speaks to the importance of validating, establishing and, and validating controls that they're in place and that they're effective. If we look at the, uh, Controls can range from you know, anything on the hierarchy of controls. And this is a, a tool to understand where controls fall in as regard to effectiveness. So we look at least effective uh, PPE, certainly because we have to rely on people to wear the PPE, to wear the right, to wear it properly, to wear it at the right times. And it's not to say that PPE is ineffective because it's very effective. It's, it's just, it's the last line of defense. Um, and, from an overall hierarchy of controls perspective, it would be the, the least effective or the least reliable for those reasons I, I spoke of. Right? Now, a step above PP around effectiveness is administrative controls, and that's changing the way that people work, typically through safety procedures or policies, which require training and understanding. And if we take that up to even more effective, it would be an engineering control, which is to isolate people from the hazard. Um, so if there's a, a, a guard, covering a belt on a, on a piece of equipment, right? That machine guard would be a engineering control, right? Or a railing preventing um, someone from falling over, uh, over a ledge, right? Those are engineering controls, keeping people separated from the hazard. And then another more effective type of control is around substitution, uh, replacing the hazard with one that is less risky. And obviously the most, <laughs> Effective control is to eliminate the hazard altogether. And that obviously makes a lot of sense. Uh, but a lot of times it's just simply not practical to be able to eliminate um, a hazard. So when we look at a, a SIF precursor, right, it's a high risk situation that has an absent or ineffective control. Organizations are 
generally really good at identifying hazards, but I'm curious, how good are we uh, identifying effective controls? So again, this is anonymous, uh, it's just information discussion, but curious if you rate on a scale of one to five, your organization's ability to identify a control that is ineffective or inadequate or absence with five being world-class, like anytime a control is not effective, you find it, right? Or take that to the other end where you need, need help, need a lot of help. So if you go ahead and give your own informal ad hoc assessment, that would be your opinion, that would be great or helpful, thank you. All right, about, it's like a nice, uh, nice bell curve there. So. Now, um, thank you for that. There are different ways to check whether controls are effective. They can be simple spot checks, which can be done, for example, to ensure people are wearing PPE. You can do audits to make sure people are following safety processes and procedures. Um, inspections that can be performed for engineering controls to make sure the machine guard is in place and that it's robust and effective or secured. Um, now, one organization I know does what's called an evaluation of effectiveness, right? And that's around SIF critical corrective actions. So, for example, if a procedure was modified as a result of a SIF potential event, so they um, build an, and implemented a procedure, um, some period of time after that was done, say three months or four months, but significant period of time, it will be assessed from someone outside the department or even outside the facility, really to verify that that corrective action is still effective, right? that it's stuck, so to speak. So in this case with the procedure, was it new procedure, did it route through uh, proper document control, make sure it's like live and active, were people trained, um, on that procedure, were new tools purchased as required in that procedure? And are those new tools being used in the field? Um, were new warning signs installed, right? So on and so forth. And this really robust deep dive of looking at a critical control around a SIF potential activity, it really ensures that the re risk is, is reduced, that the control was effective at reducing the risk. And more importantly, it, it assesses that that risk reduction has been sustained. Now, when we look at the third priority around the SIP prevention strategy, um, it's really around data and metrics. Right? It's, it's important to have data, right? Because that, that information can help you build your organization specific risk profile. I talked about earlier. Right? Now, different sources of data it could be injury reports, it could be near miss reports, inspections, observation data, corrective actions, audit deficiencies, um, even feedback boxes from the field. Right? So this data can assist you in identifying where SIF risk is within your organization, where that SIF risk is present. In some cases, it can even help you predict when and where future events may occur. So once you have this data, the next step is really to develop metrics that drive behaviors that control and eliminate serious injuries and fatalities. So what gets measured gets done, right? So if we look at the, my favorite hierarchy of controls again, um, if you assign each corrective action around an incident to its associated level on the hierarchy of controls. Um, and then you can measure like what percent of corrective actions you know, are, are at each level. So for example, if you've got 90% of your corrective actions that are PPE and administrative, then you've got uh, less effective controls. Right? And by having this as a measure, if people understand that this is a metric, an important um, measuring uh, device for the organization, as they're developing corrective actions, 
and they know that, then they'll be more prone to pursue elimination or substitution or an engineering control, right? And those are much more effective um, controls as we know, right? But by having that as a metric, what percent of controls are um, higher on the hierarchy, that changes people's behavior and ultimately makes the workplace safer. So, um, so another example around metrics, and, and I saw some questions coming in, so I'll, I'll, I'm gonna save the questions for the end. Uh, we'll definitely have time at the end to go over questions. Um, so another example on a metric may be anchor compliance point inspections, right? Anch anchor points are critical control devices, right? When somebody falls, they absolutely have to work, right? And having that um, as, a, as, a, as a metric, right? It tells people that it's important and it helps change behavior, right? So metrics and accountability, they drive behaviors and so it's important to use metrics that drive SIF reduction behaviors within your organization. Now, the culmination of all this strategy is to look at this data and ultimately identify and implement interventions or controls. Because by doing this, it allows us to make previously unrecognized dangerous work visible and safer for our teams. So one organization identified falling objects as a potential SIF risk after implementing serious injury and fatality prevention strategy. So through deeper analysis of that data, they realized that it was drop tools when people were working up high. Right? And the controls that they had at the time were not robust enough. So those controls were upgraded and they required tool tethers and nettings and some other controls. And in addition to communication and training, um, they were able to ultimately eliminate tools being dropped. So by gathering that SIP potential data, it allowed them to look at it through a different lens and help them identify that that risk, which wasn't necessarily on the radar before. And you can do the same with the SIP prevention strategy in your organization. Now, I've just shared with you about a decade's worth of experience, um, both for myself, but also from other member companies in the Campbell Institute. And I know for me personally, there was some hard learned lessons. And so for you to not have to learn those lessons the hard way, I'm gonna share a few of them. The first one is around trust and transparency, right? To, Successfully implement a SIP prevention strategy or really any other business strategy, an organization it really needs a culture of trust and transparency. Uh, there has to be open and honest communication around reporting of events and around reporting of unsafe situations. Because reporting of SIF potential incidents, it's the basis for all the data and all the input of our prevention efforts. So if we don't have that information, then we're driving blind. So if people only report like paper cuts, right? And they hide almost falling off the roof. Well, then we're not gonna know about them falling off the, almost falling off the roof until it actually happens and somebody falls and then it's too late. So thank people when they report, don't penalize them. We'd also compare different departments and different shifts around reporting. And if you see one area is not reporting events or it's much lower than their peers, then I would get concerned and start asking questions as to why. Which takes us to our second lesson, tone. So when learning of a SIF potential event, leaders should respond really with care and compassion. And I find that most leaders do care and respond with the desire to learn how to prevent it from happening again. So people knee jerk, um, it, it doesn't help. It may be cathartic, but it typically doesn't help. So allow for open and honest discussion of how and why the event occurred. And that way we can identify appropriate solutions so that it doesn't happen again and become an actual serious injury or fatality the next time. Want to treat 
potential sifts really with the same gravitas and approach as we would an actual serious injury or, or, or even a fatality. Now, when leaders are in the field, they can also change the conversation, right? So instead of asking, you know, how's work, how are you? Or maybe in addition to asking, how are you? <laughs> leaders can ask, you know, how are you, what hazards do you have here? Um, are there any exposures to receiving or getting a, a serious injury? Right? Do you have everything you need to protect you doing this job without being hurt and having a serious injury for you or your coworkers? Right? Have you ever exercised stop work authority? Right? And so when leaders ask questions like these and when they hear the answers, it, it really helps to personalize SIP prevention, put it on a human level. And that's helpful for the leaders and as well as the workforce because they know the leaders care. And ultimately helps everybody focus on SIP prevention. So now there's no need to read the slide. It'll be available to you, certainly because there's a lot of information on here. A lot of good information too. Um, but the takeaway here is what I want to illustrate is that it's really critical to integrate your SIF prevention efforts, SIF prevention strategy into your existing program, your existing EHS management system. So for example, you can expand your current incident investigation program to include SIF potential assessment, right? And when to trigger an investigation for a SIF potential event. You can also update your measuring and monitoring matrix with your SIF related metrics, those ones that we drive behavior change. And so by integrating SIF prevention into your existing management system, it accelerates the change. It accelerates how people work through the change and accelerates change management. Because people understand more how it fits into their existing work and their existing processes. That way, SIF doesn't become something extra. It doesn't become a bolt-on. It's not more work. It just simply becomes the way you work. So now we'll pivot to COVID. Uh, and man, back in March, I, I, none of us I'm sure could have predicted what was ahead of us. Um, change our lives in every, every way. Uh, it's probably an understatement of the year. Um, change how we work, obviously, how we socialize. And it's also had an impact on, on SIP prevention, both positive and, and negative. I think, you know, just kind of get an idea of change. How many people are working from home today besides me? All right, drum roll. Okay, About two thirds working from home and one third not working from home. And certainly um, working from, I know for me working from home, um, you know, I certainly enjoy being with my family more and get a little time back because I'm not commuting. But I'm Downside is that I'm not out on the field. I'm not visiting the branches like I have in the past. I'm not connecting with our employees and our team. And, and that mirrors what I've seen across North America, uh, talking with my colleagues um, and demonstrating on the call that we've got two thirds of us working from home. Now that reduction of leadership in the field, uh, leaders simply not being there uh, creates a void of coaching. Right, it creates a void of reinforcing expectation, it creates a void of providing feedback. And that's true with safety and it's true with SIP prevention and, and frankly, most other aspects of the business. I know the summer United Rentals, we pivoted over the summer to try to get select leaders you know, back in the field to provide that human connection 
of course, following strict COVID precautions. Um, and that was very limited. Um, but it, it's certainly a, a piece that is, uh, that is missing. I was speaking with a colleague recently who started to implement CIF prevention strategy this year. And what a year to do it. Um, you know, they plan big face-to-face -face meetings, uh, you know, lunch and learns to help educate the workforce is one of the critical pieces of the strategy, but obviously it just couldn't happen. They've had to got creative with their communication, do e-learning, do different modules, um, webinars, and it's, it's certainly slowed their implementation efforts a bit, um, but it's, it's strengthened the resolve, I can tell you that. And I think something else that will be interesting is because it's taking longer, you know, will that will ultimately be more effective because they've workforce has had more time to process it, right? It's kind of a slow drip. Um, so that, that'll be interesting to see. Also early in the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of focus around rightfully so around COVID-19 um, and, and understanding simply how it spread, learning how to prevent it from spreading, to keep people safe, learning how to manage the business when someone did get infected. Um, and with all that focus on COVID-19, there was very little bandwidth for left for traditional safety uh, or SIP prevention. And as a result, I know a number of organizations saw their injury rates deteriorate this year. I was talking with um, Kristen Bell and, and we were talking about this point and um, she was sharing that she's seen a mixed bag and, and when we got into it, it's really about risk um, and what people were doing or weren't doing, right? And so if business changed and employees were doing less risky work, um, then their injury rates tend to go. If they were doing work that still had uh, risk exposure, um, their rates declined. Kind of with that whole purpose was really around job assessments um, and, and trying to limit work down to, to one individual, right? To prevent any opportunity for getting infected with COVID-19. And so job assessments were reviewed to, to see if work could be um, consolidated. And in some cases it, 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 it was, right? And, and there was less, um, less people doing that job, right? So the, the good news is that you didn't have miscommunication because there was fewer people on a job or one person really. Um, on the flip side, there was an extra set of eyes or spot checking. Um, but the fact is that any review of a job is, is beneficial. Along those same lines, saw use of contractors decrease uh, significantly, again, in that vein to limit the number of people on a, on a work site. That work was either postponed or some of it was performed in house. And for that work that was performed in house, there was a risk of um, being less familiar. And, and being less familiar, there's you know, risk, of, risk of injury. And really um, kind of one of the, the main things I've seen since the pandemic is around technology, the use of technology being accelerated. You know, example, uh, Zoom has become a, a, a verb, common verb this year, where last year, talking about, right? But we're all doing virtual meetings now. Um, telemedicine is an example, something that's here to stay. And when we look at um, contract tracing, um, really the use of, of wearables uh, is something that is, is changing, right? So contract tracing, a number of companies um, provide wearables to do contract tracing on a work site to understand how people interact, how close they get in case someone gets infected. Um, and those wearables are typically, you know, like a bracelet or even a necklace with something on it. But as wearables become more common, they get normalized, right? And that normalization can ultimately be leveraged further in the workplace to prevent a SIF. So one example that could be in use today and hopefully will be in use, um, accelerate the use, but is around proximity meters with mobile equipment and humans, right? So if you get too close, um, 
an alarm can go off if a human gets too close to a, um, say a forklift, an alarm can go off and it can even be configured that it'll stop the forklift from operating altogether, preventing an incident. So the wearables, um, I think it's, is one change that, that we'll see becoming more normalized. Um, the pandemic has added to the case for wearable technology. Drones, um, you know, there was, I, I did read some articles about using drones to deliver medicine, which would be helpful, pretty cool, but uh, it was more hypothetical. Um, but what isn't hypothetical is using drones in the workplace today uh, for improved safety and improved efficiency. Like one example is around stockpiles. Drones can do aerial maps um, of, a, of a stockpile and do a 3D map, uh, which provides uh, much more accurate inventory, prevents somebody from um, having to eyeball it or worse getting on the stockpile and engulfment hazard. Another example are drones can go into confined spaces, right? So to inspect a boiler, for example. So if a drone, um, so you don't have to set up scaffolding, right? You prevent anybody from going in a confined space. A drone can go do that uh, much more quickly, much more inexpensively, and obviously much more safely without putting humans at risk. So as technology like wearables and drones continue to become more commonplace, it will certainly need, uh, it will certainly reduce the need of exposing humans to SIF level risk. So if you want to see a few other additional lessons shared by some of the Campbell member companies, along with additional approaches in developing a SIF prevention strategy, you can download a copy of the white paper. There are two white papers. There's the one that was just published. Uh, there's one that was published a few years ago. They're both available for free uh, on the Campbell website. And I want to say thank you to um, Magali and the, the Campbell team uh, for putting the webinar together. And also thank the colleagues that are part of the working group, as well as those that contributed to the paper. You know, as, as um, just in closing, working with Dr. Krauss on the initial SIF paradigm work, um, after working with him, I, I knew that I could prevent someone from drowning again. And I, I could do that by eliminating people working near water or eliminating the water itself. And, and that's ultimately what we did. We developed a comprehensive water safety program and it took into account all instances of people working near water from taking water samples to people working on a dock. Now for earthwork near water, we required that the water level be pumped down to just a few feet. And I knew I'd done the right thing when I received a call one day and someone reported that a bulldozer had gone into the water again, ground its left as before, and this bulldozer had gone in the water. But this time, the outcome was different. This time the operator grabbed his life ring, went out the already open door of his cab and he sloshed safely to shore. So utilizing a SIF prevention strategy, it'll give you a roadmap to reduce and eliminate these significant, these types of significant events in your organization and ultimately it'd save people's lives. So I wanna thank you um, for your time and attention today and I'm happy to take a few questions. Great, thank you so much, Taylor, for that great presentation. Um, it looks like we have a few questions coming in and I, I also see that a few participants are raising their hands. We're going to just use the Q&A feature for this webinar. So if you have a pressing question, please just type it in there and we'll try to get to as many as we can today. Um, the first question I see in here, Taylor, is is root cause analysis after injuries analogous to SIF prevention? Uh, it's a piece of SIP prevention. Certainly the information that um, you identify the causes to an accident uh, and more importantly, those corrective actions that are developed are integral. I didn't necessarily speak to it in great detail, but um, yeah, I, I probably glossed over. But the fact is that it, it, root cause analysis is an uh, integral piece about learning um, what happened 
and understanding how to prevent it from happening again. So unequivocally, yes, it is. Thank you. Another question is, can you give examples of employee facing leading indicator metrics you feel work well in effectively implemented SIF prevention programs? Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, that one might take a little more time, but I, I think it, it depends who's looking at the metrics, right? So uh, for field facing metrics, you know, it, it could be something like, you know, fall protection, uh, harness inspections, I'm just making this up, right? As an example, because it's something that's relevant to them, it's something that they need to do. Um, and so it, it makes sense for them, right? As you get, you know, higher in the organization, sometimes those same metrics don't, or need to be aggregated in some form or fashion. Um, but that, you know, that, that could be one, certainly. Um, Again, it, I, I would say the metrics need to be relevant to the people you know, that are having influence on those metrics. Um, there was a, a, another Campbell paper on leading indicators. And within that paper, there are certainly some, some CIF relevant leading indicator uh, metrics that, that goes into much greater detail. Taylor, our next question comes with a little bit of background. So, um, this person is saying, I'm a safety manager. Most of the people I deal with don't want to make changes other than reprimand to attempt to change behavior. They have been this way for a long time and I have, and I have difficulty showing them when other changes should be made. Do you have any suggestions for convincing them to spend extra time slash money to look at other alternate solutions and implement when practical? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. The, 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 and, and it's, um, that's unfortunate. That's a, a tough situation to be in, you know. And ultimately, to change people's attitudes or approaches, you can do it trying to win their hearts and minds, right? I mean, I this funeral and this experience of this gentleman drowning was horrible, um, it, you know. And I wasn't even part of his family, um, or I didn't even know him, right? And so, um, until someone you know goes through that, it, it's hard to personalize it. Um, but if you can make safety, you know, personal and have people share personal stories, it humanizes it, um, you know, with the direct impact of someone that they can relate to. So that, that would be one approach. Certainly another approach is through data. I'm an engineer. I, I like data. Um, but, you know, getting data and information about risk within your organization, you know, and preventing that constructively to management or senior management along with proposed solutions, right? You just don't want to dump a problem on them, but along with proposed solutions, um, yeah, I think are, are a couple effective ways to help change, uh, change the attitude, certainly. Now, one uh, this next set of questions are come with two parts. How important is benchmarking SIF occurrences with, how important is benchmarking SIF occurrences with industry peers? And um, given the different definitions you mentioned earlier, what is life altering and how can we standardize the data for benchmarking? Yeah, I think with regard to, um, you know, CIF, CIF, actual CIF, you probably could do some benchmarking. It's probably not quite apples to apples, but the definitions aren't widely divergent. Um, and if you use it as a, a relative, kind of reference point, you know, there's probably some value there. Um, I certainly wouldn't do like absolute, uh, you know, rigid type comparisons like you might with a recordable rate because of the reasons that you say, um, you know, one of the things, um, so, so I think it's it's okay, but I would do it with a grain of salt and the big, big asterisk next to those benchmarking um, exercises. With regard to, uh, a standard definition, that's one of the things that we've talked about and, and you know, ultimately have kind of our eye on the prize is coming up with a standard definition around a serious injury. Um, you know, we're certainly not the only ones. Um, but as the paradigm gets understood more broadly, then, you know, I think there's more um, momentum and, and desire and push to get a standard definition. And so I think Magali, we might have our next action item for the working group. Certainly noted. I'm sorry, was there a third piece of that question? 
Um, I think it was just, um, let me take a look. Just uh, last part was how can we standardize, standardize the data for benchmarking? Yeah, I think one other point around, so those were actual SIF events. I think it, it'd be much more difficult to uh, benchmark around potential SIF events. What you could do is simply, you know, benchmark if organizations are, you know, decreasing or, or uh, increasing possibly. Um, but, uh, but there's going to be a lot more variability on the benchmarking for potential, SIP potential, for sure. Put that on the list, Tim and Kali. Next question is, do you have EHS on your CapEx boards for funding decisions? And I believe the follow-up to that is for SIF, specifically for SIF reduction projects. Yeah, I mean, short answer is yes. Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. Yeah. Thank you. Another question is, do you consider Lotto to be an administrative control or an engineering control? Well, it's kind of deep. Um, <laughs> be, be a politician, say both. Um, you know, certainly the Lotto program is an administrative control, right? I think the um, the lock itself would be an engineering control because you're physically separating that uh, equipment. So in that case, they go, they would go hand in hand. You could have a, a lock on it with no program and you're going to be safe, right? Um, you could have a program with no locks and it'd be you know, very dangerous, um, which kind of alludes to the degree of effectiveness. Is, so ultimately the low toe program is administrative control. And, and the lock itself would be more of an engineering control. Looks like we have time for maybe two more questions. So the next one is, what type of data analytics tool are you successfully and looking for how to analyze large amounts of data to get to predictive identification of SIPs? Um, that's, that's a really good, a good question. Um, so I, I, I use, um, I mean, Excel, I mean, it's a little archaic. Um, it, it Mosaic and another program, which name eludes me right now, which was a more statistical software, which could help. Um, from the data with each SIF event or SIF exposure, um, we would categorize incidents into different risk types um, and do some analysis that way to identify risk exposure um, so that yeah so that that's that's what we did so it depending on the exact metric I mean we did some correlations around um, time of events trying to identify precursors um, you're looking at maybe days of the week or times after holidays um, you know see if that correlates to incidents or near misses um, Excuse me. And so, yeah, it depends on the level of analysis you want. Um, just make sure that you got, you know, good data going in because if you don't have good data going in, garbage in is garbage out. All right, and finally, um, does an injury need to occur for the event to be considered a, a SIF potential? No, uh, that's, a, that's a really excellent question. Um, the, the answer is no, it doesn't. Right, you can have a, a near miss that has SIF potential for sure. Um, in the study that Dr. Krauss did early on, um, there was just more reliable or higher confidence that OSHA recordables were reported um, and just a lot more variability around near misses being reported. And so that's part of the reason that injuries were being, only injuries were being assessed um, for that study. But yeah, certainly uh, other incidents beyond, you could have environmental, um, potentially serious incidents or um, property damage type. So it's not just, I wouldn't just limit it to injuries for sure. All right, with that, I see that we hit uh, noon here at least central time. So I wanna thank you Taylor, um, for your time today and your insight. Um, it was very valuable and um, to, the, to anyone who was able to attend, 
Um, you, we are recording this session and we'll distribute it after um, within a few days via email. If there are any questions or um, anything else you'd like answered that we didn't get to, please feel free to reach out. Um, the camelist.org is where you can find all of our research, um, but you can also find my information there if you happen to have any further questions. But thanks again, Taylor, and thank you all for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brianna. Bye-bye.